Fiction and reality. New stories, new ideas. Little Beth Entertainment. Welcome to episode 101 of The Rocketry Show at therocketryshow.com. It's a workshop episode. We've got quite a few emails about the same kind of topics the last few weeks. So we decided to just do a show on them. There's two different topics we'll be talking about. One would be shear pins and the other would be the Marco Polo tracker. And we have joining us a good friend of uh, Jim and I, Andrew Kleinhens, as we start a new format for the workshop episode. And Andrew is our first special rocketry guest on our workshop episode to discuss this all with you. And this all happens right after this. Stick around. The rocketry show starts right after this. Going up in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, liftoff. From Little Beth Media, a new podcast on model rocketry. With build techniques, model rocket history, interviews with industry insiders, stuff for beginners and longtime model rocketeers, everything from low to mid power. The Model Rocket Show with me, the Rocket Noob at themodelrocketshow.com or anywhere you download podcasts. The Rocketry Show would like to thank the following patrons for their support. Todd West, Matt Tudor, Les Rayburn, Stephen Spencer, Bill Cook, Jason Cook, Gary Rosenfield, Greg Ziegler, Toby Vanderbeek, Ken Blade, Eric Hamilton, John Beans, Scott Halla, Guy Wadsworth, Phil P., Tom Rum, Michael Moore, Stephen Ray, Amanda Ho, Steve Sainer, Mark, RailButtons.com, and Todd West. If you wish to show your support and become a patron of The Rocketry Show, just visit us at support.therocketryshow.com. Welcome to The Rocketry Show. All right, let's go. A podcast that is all about advanced and high-power rocketry. Amateur-built rockets starting at mid-power to higher-power versions. This program is hosted by the team who loves the smell of burning rocket propellant in the morning. Here are CG, Gene, and model rocket guy, Jesse Yu. Welcome to The Rocketry Show at therocketryshow.com. It's a workshop episode also, the end of the year, Christmas, New Year's, Hanukkah, whatever you want to make it. It's that kind of show for you. You get a chance to do that. And uh, we're trying something new with our workshop episode now. Um, Because I I was getting a little worried about our workshop episodes being uh, starting to get a little like the same because, you know, you can only have so many projects going on at a time, but people like to hear us talk about projects. And mm-hmm. so, uh, so Jesse and I were kind of brainstorming and bouncing <clears throat> things back and forth. And that's when we came up with an idea of let's invite a rocketeer on with us to talk workshop talk with us because that will force the topic to be something fresh and something that that rocketeer <laughs> is either working on or some specialty or, or whatever. So I figured that'll add a great twist to it. So before, oh, nice. so before we get started, I'm CG. I'm Jim. And I'm Jesse Yu, model rocket guy. All righty. And in this episode, our very first guest in our workshop episode, longtime friend and fellow rocketeer, the mythical Andrew. Andrew is somebody who, for me, um, was at the club I was at the, on pretty much the when I joined. So he got to see um, all these projects that I talk about on the show in their very beginning phases when I was cramming them all in mm-hmm. the BT-60 tubes. And then, you know, Jim would later come along at the tail end of the early part as I went into my level one launch. So so I'm sure we'll have some stories in there as well. Uh, he can verify all these things I was talking about <laughs> if you want to. And probably then some, probably more <laughs> yep. things I forgot about. But welcome to the show, Andrew. Big Andrew K. Hello. Yeah, hello. How are you all? Thanks for having me on. And it's- I am real. Yes, he is. And, <laughs> yeah, very much so. And you probably remember from our shows that uh, Andrew was uh, the first person that I um, approached about being the co-host for the Rocketry Show. And, but this he wasn't is the able. Guy. To, yes, this is the guy, and he wasn't able to <laughs> do that the at the time. And uh, then later on, I met Gene, and then he so I was the runner-up. So <laughs> no, know. it was destiny. It yeah. was destiny. Come on, it there was you destiny. go. 
fate. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, so and, and also that funny so, how all this stuff worked out. But guess what? Andrew's on the show what? now. <laughs> and it's good to there have you. We're gonna pick your well, brain, bro. You. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna talk. Right on. We, yeah. You know, yeah, so we're gonna be talking about what we're working on, but at the same time, we we happen to get, you know, serendipity is a funny thing. We had a number of listeners mm-hmm. ask us questions about shear pins. And mm-hmm. uh so and Andrew has done shear pins for probably what, like 10 years or more on, you know, in the very questions that these people are asking about. And I figured, you know, what better way to do this and to kick it off with, but by asking that, but we'll get to that in a second. Uh, so Andrew, uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, the, you know, your background since now you're real to everyone <laughs> and your rocket story. Well, <laughs> well, it all began. No, I'm kidding. Once um, upon a time. Oh. <laughs> I was born a poor black child. <laughs> oh, wow, jerk. we're gonna have so much fun tonight. I love this. Um, <laughs> oh, I do. Um, so yeah, uh, um, Cornelius speaketh the truth. I met Cornelius at the MTMA launch in Aurora, Ohio, and uh, we fast became friends along with Jean. And uh, uh, at that time, I was doing a lot of. Um, I was doing a lot of mid power with uh, reloadables, you know, F 24s and Mm -hmm. things like that. And then uh, quickly went into uh, high power. And everything changed when I bought my first RC2 mini from Lock, Barry at Lock, and got into dual deploy. (laughs) And I got into that uh, with with two and a half inch uh, rockets that I would like to fly in those 29 millimeter hazmat free motors, which are the best bang for your buck out there. Yep. And um and then so yeah, they told me I needed to use shear pins and uh um and I've been using them ever since. But I'm a Tripoli member, uh joined Tripoli uh through uh northern Ohio Tripoli. I got did my level one out in Amherst. Uh and as things progressed, I got involved with Tripoli Mid Ohio down in Springfield, Ohio with Gary Dickinson at the time. And okay. uh good friends with Lee Berry as well and a bunch of guys down there. And that's where I did my level mm-hmm. two on a on a lock on a lock uh, parts rocket, a scratch built rocket. And I just recently got my level three down there on November fourteenth on a scratch built um, paper and wood rocket as well. So um, I kind of travel a lot. I even know. Um, thank you, Jim. Um, <laughs> even though I uh, I consider I consider no, uh, Northern Ohio Tripoli and Tripoli Mid Ohio my home clubs are where I have most connections to I'm uniquely positioned to be able to tra- uh, travel to Indiana. Um, I've gone to Pennsylvania, New York, and Ohio. I kind of go wherever I can launch because basically rocketry is all I do as far as a hobby is concerned. So it's one of those people who are steeped into it. And you can blame that on my wife as well. She's the one who got me into this hobby, but uh, so yeah, I'm a proud Tripoli member <laughs> and um uh, <laughs> but I also I also like model rockets too. I b- build quite a few model rockets and fly with a group out in Fort Wayne, Indiana, uh, out there as well. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. All righty, very cool. Yeah, and I'm I think I'm trying to remember. You actually, you you were stood. You were there for my level one out in Middlefield, my level two in Amherst, yep. and my uh, level three down at Tripoli, Mid Ohio. So you've seen my whole evolution yes. in like nice. about four or five years, I think, something like that. So and I've, you've yes. picked my, and I, I, I picked uh, your brain. <laughs> yes, go ahead. And it's it's it goes both ways. It goes both ways because I I mean I love to see how, uh, and I learn mostly from other people. And I think um, one of the things that you know. What people could do, or uh, what I like to do, is watch how other people do things. You know, I learn a lot from from Corny. I watch how he's like. I call him the watchmaker of rocketry. Like he makes these complex yeah. electronic systems, and I learned the the joys and and the advantages of modular systems and in in, uh, in his rockets. And um, Jim, I love your your style of uh, of painting and reckless joy and abandonment when it comes to building, painting, and flying. And I learned a lot <laughs> from you guys. So. <laughs> Seriously, I mean that's that's how it is, and we all we learn from each other. You know? so, yeah, um, that's that's very true. Because I, you know, I remember picking your brain in the early days when I showed up as like a, a brand new born again, like you know, still wet behind the ears. Like, 
uh, what's a reloadable? <laughs> and, you know, and, and you guys took me under your wing and you just kind of, you know, kind of gave me some skinny. So it was, it was awesome. We all have these little stories like that of, of the people that kind of led us back into the hobby. And it, it's nice to talk to those people on the show. So I'm super excited that you're here, Andrew. Well, thank you very much. I'm, it's it's kind of like, uh, it's very, I'm kind of going down memory lane right now. I remember when Jim and I met at some park, I don't know what town that was in. Jeez, I don't even know where that was. Some park with baseball fields. <laughs> and we were like flying, popping off all these rockets. <laughs> and uh, it was just a good day. And um, I just, um, oh my gosh, no matter where I went, I had to fly an F-24. It was crazy. I don't even want to know. Anything. That's right. But there's so many fun... There's so many great memories, you know, especially, you know, you know, you know, flying the field out in, uh, in middle, uh, not middle field. Oh, where was that? In Aurora, man, with the trees on one end and the houses on the other. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The it, glory and the joy and the pain. Yeah. And, the, <laughs> and, and, then, <laughs> yeah, and by that point, so I was dual times. deploying on, yeah, I was dual deploying in Aurora, which is a very small field. So, because I didn't want it to go into the house. Nope. So. Right. Remember that kick I was on? For, uh, I, I bought all these lock rockets with two-inch tubing, the little ones, like the Iris and that little Sandhawk. I mm-hmm. flew a dual deploy out there. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was just like crazy. And that, that was the one day where my wife actually remembers where, I, where she called it the day I barfed G80s. Because I got this... Um, <laughs> I got this little bonus. I got this little bonus in my in, with my business. And I bought like a box of G80s. And, and um, I flew like 10 in one day. I mean, it was <laughs> disgusting. And I felt like a little kid, you know, because I was like, I, you, I flew all my G80s. I don't have any more left, you know. But it was just like, oh my gosh, I was so crazy. I still kind of like that. But the motors are bigger now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And they take a little more time to prep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's lots of memories here. Jeez, as we keep talking, it's just oh my word, yeah. And that, oh, that's good. That's the fun show. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. They, my fun. Yeah. The, my fun memory with the club is uh, you know one of those days at the club out there, in Middlefield, where you you live right there, and which is kind of cool. But and we had our our gathering get together. We're gonna barbecue and. And occasionally mm-hmm. a rocket would shoot off, and you know, <laughs> and that's pretty much what it was. That's right, you know, barbecuing and some rockets would go up. Okay, I got another hot yep. dog here. Don't forget Cheryl's cookies. You know. Oh yeah. Well, absolutely. Those are the best. For those of you guys who don't know, my wife brings cookies to launches, and uh, and I'm some of the best so, in the world. So happy for that. <laughs> so there's a little story behind this. If you'll indulge me, I I went to I went to Potter um, for the first time. I've been there in like two years. And I pulled up and I, I parked next to this guy. I couldn't remember his name, but I knew who he was. And he knew me. And I hadn't seen him in two years. I get out of the car. I'm like, hey, how's it going? He goes, hey, did your wife bring any cookies? <laughs> and I was like, hi, it's no. good to see you too. But yeah, I got cookies. <laughs> so after two years, that's the first thing I remember. Did your wife bring the cookies? <laughs> Which is kind of That funny. sounds like a good launch. <laughs> yes. Yes, son of a... Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good to see you, too. So, Got to get a cookie right here. <laughs> yeah. What, do you want a cookie yeah. or something? <laughs> oh, well. But, yeah. All right, so if my wife winds up listening at some point, so, babe, if you're listening, you should probably make cookies for the club. The sand. Be cool. Yeah. Be cool with, like, Andrew's wife. Everybody does it. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be uh, shooting off a lot of memories off and on as we go. It's it's inevitable. You know, there's a lot of lot of history between three of us here on the show. And this is our first time publicly talking about it here. Um, Ever. Yeah. Let's start with uh, the, the, uh, the listener question first. So we'll get something of interest to the audience. And then I'm sure we'll we'll segue back in this stuff here. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, this is Jesse. I guess you're, you kind of curated the questions and stuff. So sheer pin questions. Andrew. <laughs> so... Uh, we were kind of talking about this, you know, before the show, and uh, I just kind of wanted you to reiterate some of the questions that we're getting from uh, some of our listeners are, how do you figure how many sure pins you need? Yeah. Where do you put them? Well, um, so that's a very good question. It, it, it primarily is a function of how heavy your payload section is um, and the size of the rocket. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll begin by saying everyone, there's more than one proper way to do something. I can... Yeah. Uh, 
I can tell you how I was taught and some of the things that I've learned through trial and error. So I'll preface everything I say with that. It's not like, you know, there's only one correct way. But what I've learned <clears throat> is that if you're flying a two and a half inch rocket with a light nose cone, um, you know, with a light payload section, and it's not fiberglass, uh, then two shear pins would work just fine. You never want to go with one. Um, you know, but if you're flying a fiberglass rocket, you know, that's three inches in diameter or even two and a half inches with, okay. you know, electronics and a nose cone and an aluminum tip, then it's mm-hmm. a bit heavier, right? And you probably right. would want to go with three. And I say three, meaning two, 256 sizes. But I learned the hard way uh, a lot of times. Um, well, not a lot of times. A few times I learned the hard way. Oh, you got a story. Tell us the story. <laughs> um, the story is this. I, I, I'm the type of guy, and, and Gene and Corny will, will definitely start laughing when they hear this. I'm the type of guy who likes to blow it apart or blow it up. Um, I will not. <laughs> okay. blow, blow it up or blow it out. <laughs> energetic charges. I do have energetic charges because I, I had a few times where I didn't have enough charge and I paid the price. Um, and so basically, yep. if you do not have a long enough uh, drogue shock cord, What's going to happen is, is that that robust charge, or even a charge that's just adequate, will shoot that payload off and it'll recoil, and all the stuff on the inside will push on the nose cone and it'll pop it off. Mm. So, to begin with, to begin with, I would always recommend having a disgustingly large or long um, shot cord, uh, mm-hmm. a booster shot cord or drogue cord, as I call it. Yep. Mine are about 20 feet. I mean, I, I make them nice and long so that there has enough. The mm-hmm. payload has enough time to decelerate and not recoil. Um, and for the love of God, don't use underwear pay, uh, underwear elastic. That's that's, <laughs> that's that'll just recoil back, <laughs> right? Never right. and damage damage your booster. It's just a horror show. So there's a lot of factors in play. So think about think about you know the, it depends on okay if you're flying a fiberglass or a cardboard rocket, uh, and and if so, how much does it weigh? If your nose cone is loaded with stuff or is it empty? They all kind of factor in to how much, uh, how many pins you're going to put in. Um, so, having said that, where the rubber meets the road with this, let's say a three-inch lock iris. Okay, um, I put two, two, mm-hmm. uh, two fifty-six shear pins. My three-inch, um, my okay. three-inch Mac Performance uh, Scorpion, which is canvas phenolic. Now that has a nose cone bay on it, slightly heavier. Um, okay, I have three. So. Is that a fiberglass nose cone? That is not a fiberglass. I got the okay. the the nose cone bay, kind of like uh, what Locke is making for bigger cones, but uh, they, okay. uh, Mac Performance makes the kits that you could put inside the nose cone and put like a tracker in or some weight. Okay. Um, so, so yeah. yeah, just think about, yeah, that is primarily, but I never go less, uh, uh, two or three. Three is pretty robust. You know, you're, it's not coming off for three, you know, Um so, like on my big five and a half inch rockets, I use uh, uh, four, four, uh, four, two fifty six uh, on a bare lock nose cone. Um, but on my level three, I used four, four forties because the nose cone was much heavier because I had the renewable, renew, uh, removable weight nose cone system in it. So, and even then, I increased the mm-hmm. lock shot cord length on my booster section to darn near what was it? Uh, Gee whiz! I but yeah, I was forty five feet long, so I wanted that when that chart when apogee charge went off that that nose mm-hmm. that payload had a long way to go before it reached the end of the of the um, of the uh, of the travel. You know, it's interesting. I you know all the years I've watched level three attempts and or level three flights or, or big rockets, and I kind of like take notice. Like I learned from other people's successes and their failures, and the biggest thing that right. I remembered. Uh, before I did my level three was um, the nose cone coming off at Apogee on people's large rockets. It happens mm-hmm. so often. And I think okay. it's because they have these really good robust charges. They have sh- relatively short shot cords and they don't have enough shear pins in the top, especially if, the, if they have nose weight or there's a lot of, a lot of stuff on the, in the payload section. So um, I mitigate that by having a nice long shot cord and, and using enough shear pins. I hope that answers your question. It does, yeah. actually. And well, just to add a little bit to that as a bit of a follow up, if you're using a, say, um, a five and a half inch fiberglass, would you put any shear pins on the booster to, to your altimeter bay? 
Uh, I have never done that. I did it on my level two. And I had two old guys come up to me as I was fiddling with my rock and said, you know, you really don't need that. Um, and I was like, yeah, whatever. I'm going to do it anyways. And it, I was just curious because yeah. I've, I've used them. Um, I've, I've got like um, one of the small mantis ones, the lock mantis, uh, not lock, um, okay. mad cow. And it's fiberglass. So it's like two and a half inch fiberglass. And the travel between where the, um, the airframe and the altimeter bay was like, it was kind of loose. And I was like, well, I, I have put a little tape on it, but it's, but just for the sake of argument, I actually did two shear mm-hmm. pins in that rocket just because it was, it had so much travel and it was fiberglass. If it was a, a cardboard rocket, I probably wouldn't worry about it. But with fiberglass, the weight mm-hmm. on that thing, there's a lot more weight to it. So I put in a couple of shear pins and I've had a couple, you've seen the one successful flight that I, mm-hmm. the, um, out in Amherst because <clears throat> it, it came close to the waiver. <laughs> but, um, but that was, but then that's the only time that I've ever done that. So, and I wasn't sure if it was going to be good or not because I've never heard anybody doing it before, but I just went ahead and did it. And I was, and either I lucked out then or it just happened to go okay. I, I'm not sure. So, because I've, I've never done that before, and I was just curious about that. I don't, I don't think you lucked out. I think that's a good idea. So I, I have seen a, when I was an LDR when I was at a LDRS um, back in uh, 2019, I got to fly with um, you know the lot guys and uh, Eric Camberg, and uh, Eric had a five and a half inch Magnum that he got you know sticker shock decals for and did it in a classic. Um, you know, if you guys remember the blue and red Magnum that they used to have back in the day, you know, back in the Barry Lock days. Mm-hmm. And um, he did actually use shear pins on the cardboard tubing. So that leads me up to my next question. So, Andrew, um, can you give me some recommendations of how you kind of seal off the cardboard tubing, you know, to allow you to put, you know, the shear pins for either the nose cone or in this case, like Eric had done in the body tube? Because I think you had a method that you were kind of explaining earlier. Yeah, this is uh, that's that's something yeah, that sure. uh, that I want to know more about too because I've always had this uh, overthinking paranoia about putting shear pins in in, in cardboard <laughs> airframes, and and that's a common mm-hmm. question that came up from listeners to us as well on this serendipity train. <laughs> yeah, I did it and I did it on phenolic, but right. I have not done it on cardboard. As weird as that sounds, as much as I've launched, so if you've got some insight, we'd like to hear it. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. I, um, I, I mean, not to sound weird or nothing, but Gene and, and Courtney, you know, when I lived out in Middlefield, I had a, the launch field in my, my backyard. And whenever the crops were off, I went out and flew. Yeah. And I know I say that only because I've done a lot of, of, of dual deploy on my own out there. And uh, I a lot of experimentation, 29 millimeter high powers. <clears throat> experimentation is right. Um, right. And I've actually used um, shear pins in BT-70. Um, I made a sand hawk out of BT-70. Um, I don't even know, remember where I got okay, the nose. Just under two inches. Right. And it was, but it wasn't heavy walled. It was like regular BT-70. And what I do from what I've always done is basically this. Um, I get watery CA or the very thin CA, which by the way is Satan in a bottle. Because if, <laughs> if you get that stuff, I've glued, I think, <laughs> it like, it like runs out and you don't even yeah. know you glued three of your fingers together yes. until you can't move. So you got to, you got to <laughs> yes. cut a very tiny hole, you know, <laughs> but, um, okay. So for example, a standard four inch lock, uh, cardboard airframe, uh, let's say you're at, you have your payload section. Um, this is how I do it. So I put the okay. nose cone on, um, and I drill my holes. Um, okay. let's say I'm putting three shear pins in. I uh, put my three shear pins in, um, a drill, drill them all out, pull the, sh- sh- uh, pull the nose cone out or off. And okay. I take the water CA and I saturate the, uh, saturate the whole area. Okay, so thin CA. Okay. Thin CA. This is only thin CA. This will not work. Uh, and I've tried this. Um, okay. Uh, with the thicker CA or the medium CA, it only has to be the watery stuff. Mm. So then I run a, a thin CA at the top or right on the edge of the airframe so it soaks down downwards you know like the airframe standing up Mm -hmm. into the fiber into the fiber right and then i flip the tube on its side and then i i i actually squirt a good amount of the watery ca and a two inch band around the inside of the tube in other words so i i I squirt it in there's like a little puddle at the bottom and i take a q-tip and i quickly start circling it and i make a two inch band 
you know, from from the top of the airframe down. And that and it you might want to have a fan going at this yes. time because oh. I learned yeah, right? <laughs> right. Right. So the fan will be blowing the fumes away from your eyes, right? Um, right. And what I did mention before is I put the shear, I always put my shear pin holes 1.5 inches down from the top. I've done that since day one. It's kind of like my standard position. All right. Um, so I, I make that, I make that band around, uh, you know, saturating, uh, saturating the, um, the, the, the airframe. And you never want to put accelerator on, on thin CA. You just let it sit. Um, and then after it's right. good and crispy, as I call it, or dry, um, I run 220 over it to smooth it out. Then I replace the nose cone, uh, line up my holes, and then I take a metal 250, 256 uh, screw, and I basically tap out uh, the threads. Uh, and I put it. it through the holes that I previously drilled and mm-hmm. put those all in there. So you might want to mark which one is your pilot hole. So like, you know, the first hole you drill, you might want to pull the nose cone out at the very beginning and put a magic marker, you know, circle around the hole. So, you know, you're matching up the right hole, right? From the, so you're not like yep. turning the nose cone at the at the field going, where, where did this line up? Yeah. You know? um, but anyway, so yeah, <laughs> I, I put the, I put the, um, the metal <laughs> screw and I keep going around and pull it out. And then after that, you're golden. And sometimes... Um, the, the nylon screws will get very uh, snug. It'll be very snug. So that's why I keep a 256 uh, screw in my field box, a metal one, to loosen them up if I have to. And then one okay. thing I found out too is I use the nice, I use Phillips 256 instead of the straight ones. Um, they seem to grab a little bit better. But I have done exclusively, yeah. I've, never, I've never flown, the only fiberglass rocket I have ever flown is a, um, a Wild Man Dark Star. That was the only fiberglass rocket I owned. Uh, the other f- uh, rocket I owned was a Mac Performance Scorpion, God rest its soul, a four-inch version <laughs> uh, that was eaten by a combine <laughs> because Andrew didn't okay. buy a tracker in time. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, I could have walked right up to that. But anyways, actually, my wife told me to buy another one. <laughs> anyway, so Gosh, basically what I'm awesome. trying to say is I, I, I've done nothing, but she is. I mean, good Lord. Um, Sorry. So I've done all cardboard, all cardboard uh, um, rocket payloads. In fact, I have a payload okay. I, I built when we lived in Middlefield, like what, back in 2014, 15, that I'm still using. I recycle them. So what I'm trying to get at is that cardboard hasn't mm-hmm. shown, it hasn't like the, the, all those deployments with the shear pins on the cardboard haven't stretched the holes uh, or pushed or torn the cardboard. Or anything. I've never had that problem. Even with the BT fifty seventy, I mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. what that did is it dragged, yeah. it dragged and broke the pin, but it did not cut it, which was interestingly mm-hmm. interesting because it didn't have enough oomph to cut it, but it just, it just, it just dragged it. I don't know how it <laughs> popped the head off. Like the head was still inside the rocket or inside okay. the rocket, but it just stripped it off. But that CA wicks in really nice um, to the cardboard and it makes it with all that. It's kind of like, think of it as fiberglass matting, but now you've added yep. um, a CA to make it real. It's a little bit more brittle, but I haven't had any issues with. So I say, you know, it for me, it's worked great. You know? But the key is the watery CA. And I have to attest to that because that was the method that I learned when I started doing shear pins from you. And the only thing that I do that's different is I do everything exactly that way. I put a little aluminum tape on the inside, like one, like a small quarter inch square of aluminum tape into that CA mix, just to kind of give it a little bit extra, you know, stuff. And I glue it right down there with the CA, but I've never had a problem. Wow. Okay. That's a great idea. You know what, you know what, another, another racketeer I've seen, this guy, he takes, um, he takes a Dremel and he kind of Dremels out of like a little square of the, the, a plastic of the nose cone and he puts like a little metal insert mm-hmm. into the nose cone um and that yes. actually acts as the cutting as the cutting surface and that that will cut a long time uh, easier mm. than than just a plain plastic and that also takes the stress off the cardboard as well mm. but just plain plastic the cardboard has worked for well for me and Gene you know uh with the with the tape like I yeah, like yeah, like I said, there's more than one way to skin a cat, but this I've never had any issues with it. Even my level three, I was kind of nervous with when I ground tested because uh, I moved up to 440s and I put four of them in, you know, 
I thought, wow, I wonder if this is going to, am I at the limits of this? And, and sure enough, it worked great. Mm-hmm. Looks, looks, uh, looks wonderful. You know, so there's like um, on one situation on one of my rockets, my level two archer, my five and a half inch archer, um, a, one of the holes in the nose cone section is kind of a little bit bigger now. But what I do is I just put a piece of electric tape on the head of that shear pin because it's still, it's not, it's a little loose. It's a little sloppy. So I'll just tape it in with a piece of electric tape okay. on the outside onto the head just to give it a little extra, um, you know, just to, it, it, it just keeps a little it in insurance. Place. Is, you know, I don't care. It's going to fly. So yeah keeps it just holds it in place and that's the only rocket that i've ever had that problem with and that is that is a cardboard rocket all right we're going to uh, take a quick break here on the show and we're going to come back and we'll continue our workshop discussion our guest rocketeer our very first guest rocketeer on our new version of the workshop episodes is andrew and uh, we'll be back after this don't go anywhere this is the rocketry show the rocketry show.com Lock Precision Rocketry manufactures a full line of high-quality precision fit components to meet your building, repairing, and customizing needs. Lock Precision believes in making rocket kits as light as possible while maintaining the strength required to fly with commercially available motors. Lock Precision offers a wide range of rocket kits from the 1-inch diameter Lock 1 series to high-power rockets reaching 7.6 inches in diameter. When you visit LockPrecision.com, be sure to check out their performance series series kits featuring such designs as the Black Brand 10, the Caliper ISP, and the 3.1 inch diameter Iris rocket. All of Lock Precision's performance kits comes with everything you need, including pre-slotted airframes, high-grade precision cut plywood fins and components, as well as ripstop nylon parachutes, rugged shock cords, polypropylene nose cone, and instructions. The name Lock Precision has been synonymous with mid and high power rocketry for over 30 years. Check out LockPrecision.com to find out why. LockPrecision.com Fly higher. Fly lock. It's time for Serious Rocketry. Serious Rocketry. Since 1998, providing the Rocketeer with great kits, motors, supplies, and more. They have lots of products in their ever-growing web store with fast shipping, wide selection, and courteous service. You can check out the amazing and popular Serious Rocketry kits that harken back to the days of fun-to-build detailed kits that are more than just three fins and a nose cone. Gene, what did you find? Oh, yes. There is so much stuff to find on the SeriousRocketry.com website. Thank you, CG. I have found all kinds of things, of course. Uh, But one in particular stepped out to me this week. It is the Mad Cow Rocketry 4-inch diameter frenzy. Now, check this out. It is a rocket that's over six and a half feet tall. It's a four inch diameter mad cow that's long and lean and high power flyer with its split fin design. Yes, split fins. And guess what? I have one and it whistles when it goes up. That's always a big one. It's an enjoyable build and an impressive high power sport flyer. It features a 54 millimeter motor mount and it's recommended for high power flyers. Now, the cool thing about the Frenzy, it's a large rocket, but also has an optional payload bay that you could put in an altimeter and do a dual deploy configuration if you choose to. That is sold separately, but it is always something that can be done. I have one, and I dual deploy mine, and I absolutely love it. It just screams on an I-284. I've 2,000 feet, no problem. And you still have that 54 millimeter diameter, so you could even go bigger if you choose to. Now, it's an incredible build. A typical to Mad Cow comes with everything you need. You got your rail buttons, your dual deploy capability, your uh, pre slotted airframe, tubular nylon shock cord, the 916th inch stuff, which is really good. It, um, it comes in at about 76 ounces when built, 54 millimeter motor mount, quarter inch plywood fins, and stands tall at 78.5 inches. So this is a big boy when you go out to the range, just uh, like wait until all your friends check this out. So it's the Mad Cow Rocketry 4-inch Frenzy, and it's Serious Rocketry. It's going for $131.95. So thank you, Serious Rocketry. All right, and uh, Sirius Rocketry's website features real-time stock tracking, which lets you order with confidence from their online store. No having to call or write to see if something is really in stock. When you're ready to fly, Sirius Rocketry has motors and hardware in stock from Estes through Aerotech High Power, as well as popular electronics from Jolly Logic and Estes. Be sure to ask them about their club specials while you're at it. You can visit their websites today at siriusrocketry.biz and .com. Serious Rocketry, for the Serious Rocketeer. The Rocketry Show would like to thank the following patrons for their support. Timothy Mock, Conway Stevens, Jeff Curtis, Phil Bridges, Scott Masters, Roy Tyson, Rob Hoagie, R. Smith, Gary Dow, Jay Pullman, Don Jay, 
G. Schmierden, M. Erzman, Pierre Marlou, Jeff Curtis, Brian Lopato, Philip Calvin, J. Bryan, Casey Anderson, Terry Dancer, Mark Essenwine, Jim Wilson, Jason O'Scally, and Scott Masters. If you wish to show your support and become a patron of The Rocketry Show, just visit us at support.therocketryshow.com. Welcome back to the program. This is The Rocketry Show at therocketryshow.com. CG, Gene, Jesse, and the mythical Andrew Kleinhens, who's with us. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're, we're using the answer to some of these questions from our listeners. Uh, and in particular, we're going in-depth on shear pins on rockets and more specifically, shear pins on cardboard rockets as well, because we had a lot of questions come in from our listeners on that. And I couldn't think of anyone better to answer that than... Andrew here because that's all he we I just know that he does that stuff with uh shear pins and I never on cardboard and I never had a chance to really ask him about that in detail in the field so this is a good time to you know to follow up there and it turns out Jim does that too so there you go yes nice. I learned from Andrew yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway so I got a couple more uh, questions from some listeners Andrew I want to pick your brain on with the whole shear pin thing before we move on to our next subject um, so I'll try not to take too much time but um, one of the questions that they're asking and you kind of touched base on this a second ago so um, you know you, you had mentioned that if you have a cardboard rocket you'll put like two 256 shear pins in there and if it's a uh, fiberglass you'll put up to three so is there any specific um way that you measure to do that i'm assuming that you just go from one point you know on 100 degree 180 degrees to the other for two and then if it's three you kind of do it like with whatever the fins might be or you know just kind of equal it up i mean what what do you guys usually do you said one and a half inches from the top so that's that's you know realistic but what about the circumference i'm pretty low tech what i do is i take a piece of one inch masking tape Okay. And I line it up with the edge of the top of the top of the airframe and go all the way around it. And then okay. where the, the masking tape overlaps, uh, I put press it down uh, with my fingernail, and I put a, a a pen mark on where that is. I take it off and then I lay it down on my table. Uh, the tape is that that's what I mean. The tape, and I right, measure right. the dis- mm-hmm. the total distance, divide by three or divide by four. Or to even divide by two, um, right. measure it out, um, mark it on the tape, put the tape back on, and there you have it. That's where you, yep. that's how I measure it out. And it sounds yeah. like a simple question, but I mean, I, I've been asked this by more than one person, so I figured that we probably should talk about it. You know, well, actually, I lined my fins up on my on my I lined my fins the same with the same methodology on my level three on all my scratch build rockets. I I just did I didn't use a fin jig or anything. I just <laughs> right. use the same methodology uh, to, to position well, that, that my makes fins. sense. I mean, I guess yeah, we kind of have to. You kind of have to do that if you're, you know, scratch building a four-inch rocket with four fins and you don't have a lock goblin or something like that, that you can take that measurement from it. It makes sense. The, uh, Estes doesn't make a two-marking guide for anything over, you know, BT-80. So that's probably a good, you know, rule of thumb. So no, I, <laughs> I appreciate that. It makes a lot of sense. Um, w- one more question. Um, have you seen uh, any type of... Uh, online calculator or equation for doing, you know, shear pin measurements or anything like that? Or is it just a general rule of thumb that you've uh, had with your, you know, past successes? It sounds like it's more just kind of a rule of thumb. Okay. So quite frankly, what I've done is, is I go to the people that have a lot of experience at, uh, let's say at a high power launch and I ask and see what they're doing. And then, and I emulate what they do. Um, And I also watch how they fly and make sure that, you know, I'm not walking up to a person who's crashing rockets or having no deploys. I walk up to a person I know who's flying well. <laughs> um, but also the online, I think I did one um, when I lived in Middlefield. I did a couple of charge calculators and a shear pin calculator to kind of confirm uh, what I had already established. And they, they matched up. Um, again, it's, it's a range. You know, you just want to be able to hold the, the nose cone on. Um, and you have to can take into consideration other factors. Too. So, sure. you know, like I mentioned earlier about the weight of the nose cone, and, but basically, you know, you just need enough energy or enough staying power to keep the nose cone on and enough energy to get it off. So when you consider those two forces, you, there, there's got to be a range. It's not an exact amount. There's a, there's a threshold point. But um, to answer your question, frankly, as I emulated what other people did, did my ground testing and, um, and then it. went from there. But one thing that I would recommend 
with people. One thing I do recommend is if they are, have the ability, um, I know this seems kind of weird, but let's say you pack up your pack up your whole recovery into your payload and you take your, just your payload section, your only, only your payload section with a shock cord and find a, like a stairwell or something that you can do this cleanly and hold on to the, the shock cord so it won't, with enough length that it won't hit the ground, but enough travel to emulate a, a deployment and drop it. And okay. hold on to the shock cord, and if it, and if assuming it doesn't hit the ground and you've measured properly, if the thing bounces around uh, okay. under full gravity and the nose cone doesn't come off, it's not going to come off uh, at apogee. You understand what I mean? Unless you have like a, a two foot shock cord and the charge goes off. Um, but you know what I mean? That's like a I call it the full gravity ground test for for nose cone retention. Um, I like real world tests, you know, I kind of do it that way. But after doing mm-hmm. so many scratch builds and stuff, I kind of know, I kind of know, well, you know, four other previous rockets I made just like this. Yep. This is, this is adequate. Okay. Yeah. So I use, generally use three on a three on a four inch rocket and four on a five and a half inch rocket. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that's yeah. kind of where I stand as well. Um, what, and of course you want it when you test your ejection charges, you test it with the shear pins, the shear pins in, right? I mean, that would make sense to me. Oh, yeah. Always. That's, I mean, if that's yeah, why it's you a do full an ejection test. test. Yeah. yeah. I, um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I run the, run some wire outside the vent holes and hit it with a nine volt battery and, and, uh, and let her, let her go. So that's uh, pretty much all the listener questions that I had. Um, uh, Jim and CG, did you have anything that we need, didn't touch base on as far as your pens go? Because this is pretty informative. I'm going to go back and listen to this and take notes and <laughs> make sure I do this correctly. Is there any reason why anybody would, why you would even think about using a 440, Andrew, size on the shear pens? Um, yeah, because of the weight weight of your nose cone um, and, the, and the weight of of you know, uh, the weight of the nose cone and the weight of the payload. Um, so it just stands that, okay. yeah, it's more steering power. But you guys, you guys bring up some, this whole, with this whole topic, I, I, I'm very much compelled to tell or say this, you know, I'm, I'm really kind of, um, I'm big on safety for that matter, especially when you come into these, flying these big yeah. rockets. Um, one of the things I can't stress enough to people is that they got to ground test. I mean, they have to ground test. Mm-hmm. I bumped in, I yep. bumped into so many newbies who want to go, 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 and they come out right. with their shiny new ride and they they have go fever. And, and I, I make the awkward question. I've done this before. I said, have you ground tested this? And, and they say sort of, or they mm-hmm. kind of shrug. Their, and that just brings fear into my heart, you know, because uh, right. these aren't model rockets, you know, these are bigger rockets. So, you know, always ground test, you know, um, and that's my parting word on that. Ground test, ground test. <laughs> yes. So. Good, good yes. work. Well, it's, it's also a requirement <clears throat> that you're doing level three. I mean, that's uh, something that my L3CC, he's like, well, did you test it yet? I'm like, no, I haven't had a chance to. And <sighs> he, he's pretty adamant that it has to be done. And, you know, um, I haven't done that yet. Um, cause I'm kind of waiting until like the week of, but now I think about it, it's something I might just want to just put the thing out there and do, cause I'm right in the middle of paint. Maybe that could be something that I do to make it earn its paint. I don't know. So yeah. <laughs> there you go. <clears throat> you know, and there's one thing about ground testing that I think actually I got from CG is, um, and you know how some, some people lie it down horizontally mm-hmm. and put a towel right. or something pointing it. I actually do it vertically, mm-hmm. you know, in, in that, in that situation, I ground test with the nose cone pointed up into the sky. Great. Um, yeah, great, great. Because great. it makes sense. Yep. Well, I mean, it, it makes sense because that's the, the worst possible position that it could be right. in flight, you know, or where, and, and if it doesn't happen there, then the, the odds are that if you fly it, when that thing pops, it could be a bad thing. So I, I learned that a long time ago when I started dual deploying with, um, you know, with my mid power stuff, I started ground testing with shear pins in my backyard and I took that to heart and I've been doing a vertical test. Every single, I get a cardboard box, I'll put the, you know, the whole payload section mm-hmm. down in that cardboard box <clears throat> so it's pointing up and then I'll pop it off that way. It's a big cardboard box, but, um, you know, with a big hole in it that, I could, that it's stable. The, um, yeah, I started doing the vertical because uh, my dual deploys have always been with Pyrodex, which I got a <laughs> and mm-hmm. I got, which I got from Andrew because uh, you were experiment. Andrew, you were experimenting with the Pyrodex, and 
and it just wasn't energetic enough. And you're like, oh, just, here, you can have this. Yeah, no, didn't want it. <laughs> and so I started experimenting with it and knowing that it wasn't as energetic as black powder, I wanted to make sure that it could do what I what I needed to do, which is, you know, make sure the rocket separates. So that's when I started doing the deployment with the rocket vertical. And um, and that way, I, you know, I was able to experiment with it and learn how to pack it in such a way to get enough oomph out of it to, to separate my rockets. And I've been using that ever since. And I and I've got it. I've got a good feel for Pyrodex for you know dual deploy. But now mm-hmm. I have a nice can of black powder as my Pyrodex is starting to run out. So I'll have to redo my um, ground tests just to <laughs> to get the feel for black powder. <laughs> so at some point out at uh, Amherst or whatever, I'll probably pick a day when everyone's flying rockets, I'll probably go off in the corner somewhere in the field in the, in the opening, in the clearing, and just do experimental ground tests with black powder to, to recalculate, re, recalibrate my methods with my existing stuff, but with black powder. I'm, I have a rough thing for that. I'm 75% is just my figure, if because I used to do nothing but pyrodex, and 75% of black powder, at least in the, the testing that I've done, that's about what it okay. is for me. All righty. Could be different, okay. but your, your mileage may vary. <laughs> Got it. Well, it's a good starting point. You know, I would I would test in my backyard, but I'm I'm in a you know a right not a densely populated suburb, but you know a medium populated suburb. And uh, I and there's times where <laughs> where I'm testing, I may get a little bit energetic, right. you know, too much energy in the yeah. and it'll go off like somebody's shooting guns in the neighborhood, like bam. I mean, it's echoing off all the houses. And, and it's like, uh, it's probably not a good idea to be doing this. And I'll probably get a cop coming by. Yeah. Going, what are you doing back here? I mentioned this before, but I live in a cul-de-sac. And I'm lucky enough that all my neighbors know I'm a rocket nerd because I have most of them on Facebook. And of course, they see me standing next to some, you know, nine foot tall rocket. So everybody's like, so when are you going to do one of, any more of those tests in your backyard? Um, probably next week. All right. Well, let me know. I want to see it. So I get an audience. So I, I've... <laughs> Yeah, uh-huh. that's what you got to do, man. You got to tell everybody that's... in that neighborhood and that entire roundabout, you have to tell them, <laughs> you know, hey, so I'm going to, you know, I, and I did that at my last neighborhood, but there was a couple of people who didn't know, they had no idea, like even when I was talking, I was like, well, you can come outside and check it out. I'm like, are you going to launch fireworks? No, bro. No. <laughs> but I mean. No. I may or may <laughs> not have, um, you know, static tested an I-215 motor, you know, a 54 millimeter one grain in my backyard. <laughs> you didn't. That didn't go over too well for the neighbor. Oh, oh my yeah. gosh. I've been to your house. Yeah, I've was... seen where you live. No. Yeah. Oh, oh man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the smoke. Oh, oh my gosh. And the noise. Yeah. Did you video that? No. Oh, gee, why not? <laughs> it, it was just a spur of the moment thing. And, and, most of the neighbors were okay, except for the woman up on the ladder. Uh, so she she didn't fall off. So yeah, so I don't do any ground testing anymore <laughs> of that stuff. I had to actually tell all my neighbors that what I do is perfectly legal because I was carrying my five and a half inch rockets in to to the house after a launch, and they, and I was just getting these looks. You know, when we first moved here, and I was like, "No, it's all <laughs> perfectly legal. Do not worry." And, yeah. Before we jump, because the next topic could be quite involved. So we're going to take a quick break again, and we're going to come back and talk more with Andrew. And uh, within our Rocketry workshop, this is this has been going great. I, I hope you're enjoying it as much as we are. Um, this is uh, cool stuff. So we'll be right back after this. You're listening to The Rocketry Show at therocketryshow.com. North Coast Rocketry, one of the first high-power rocketry kit companies ever, takes advantage of over 30 years of high-power experience by a world-class rocketeer. You can look to North Coast Rocketry to expand your high-power rocket fleet. In addition to great kits, North Coast Rocketry also stocks lots of must-have items and accessories for every rocketeer's workshop. Find out more about these kits and other great products today. Go to NorthCoastRocketry.com. And while you're there, don't forget to get their latest catalog, NorthCoastRocketry.com. Advanced rockets that are easy to build, fun to fly, and look great on display. It's time for E-Rockets. E-Rockets is your home for unique model rocket kits, as well as the world's largest selection of rocket parts from Simrock. They've been in business since 2009. E-Rockets.biz has a wide selection of your favorite kits, as well as their own versions of popular out-of-production models many of you have come to enjoy over the years. Jesse, what did you find? CG, one favorite rocket for most people, and I know this for a fact, and this includes Jeem, 
is the SA-14 Archer. E-Rockets carries most North Coast rocketry kits, and they currently have a good stock on the Archer rocket. The rocket includes 8th-inch plywood fins and balsa stock for the strakes. This is a 4-fin rocket, so it's going to be a good builder's kit um, for you guys that want something a little bit more involved. NCR rockets, including this one, come with that extra large, um, extra long nose cone, I mean to say. Um, they come with the Gorilla um, steel cable shock cord mount um, that uses the ferrules and the steel cable. It's actually really sturdy. And I use it for most 2.6 inch rockets and, you know, the like, because then you can always attach, you know, something to the end of it. And it reduces the chance of a zipper because it's right below the body tube. Um, so the NCR rockets also come with that uh, payload bay, which you might be able to convert to a dual deploy if you get the extra long coupler and, you know, do a little modifications there. Uh, this is a 29 millimeter rocket and can fly on most motors from uh, F to H fairly easily. Uh, the rocket will need a chute and some type of motor retention to fly. Those are the only things that doesn't come with. The Archer is a great all-around rocket, and if you like that surface-to-air look, this is one that you should consider. Right now, it's a pretty great price at eRockets.biz. All right, need parts for your own custom build? That's not a problem. eRockets.biz also supplies the Semrock line of airframes, nose cones, centering rings, motor mounts, and so much more. eRockets has more rocket parts available than anyone else on Earth. Check out eRockets.biz today to learn more. eRockets.biz. If rocketry scares you, buy a train set. Hey, all you rocket geeks out there. Do you like doing in-flight videos of your flights? And do you ever use those keychain cans and unfortunately sometimes only get videos of your thumb? Hey, this is Gene from The Rocketry Show, and that used to happen to me. I used to use those old keychain cans only to get nothing very good quality. But I found a solution to that, and it's Insane Rockets. It's an app that's available on the Google Play Store for Nexus 5X and higher. Now get this, it does 4K video. But not only that, it'll upload it automatically to the cloud and provide you real-time telemetry while tracking your rocket through Google Earth. It is amazing. Available on the Google Play Store, Insane Rockets app. It's crazy. No, wait. It's insane. The Rocketry Show would like to thank the following patrons for their support. JohnRocket.com, Jason Rodney, Sean Falkingham, Joe S., Paul Olivieri, Sam Feinberg, Michael Aylward, Brian Schenkenberger, E. Hudnell, John Thompson, Mark McBride, Doug Wade, C. McCauley, Carl Hunting, the Piedmont Student Launch Team, Steve S., Chris Irving, David Simmons, SBRFusionRocket.biz, John Kusher, Christopher Short, Kelsey Black, Brian Renneker, and Jason Rodney. If you wish to show your support and become a patron of The Rocketry Show, just visit us at support.therocketryshow.com. All right, welcome back to the program. We are with Andrew Kleins on this workshop episode of the Rocketry Show. CG, Jim, and Jesse as well. And uh, now we're going to run into the next uh, question, which is uh, the other topic that we've been getting a lot of questions from from a different set of listeners. So we're happy to be able to get some reports on this. I've been watching this in the background, and um, I'm I'm really curious about this because I didn't get a chance to follow Andrew around when he was playing around with this cool little device. But it's uh, pretty popular, so here we go. Let it roll. So, Jim, uh, I know right. that you uh, and uh, huh? you and Andrew have been doing some testing on uh, the good old Marco Polo tracker. <clears throat> am I am I on point with that? Is that the one you guys have been working on? You are. I'm holding mine in my hand as we speak. Are you serious? <laughs> really? So, yep. can you talk about that a little bit? Because um, in some of the conversations I've been having, you know, on Facebook with some of the other rocket geeks around, um, they had mentioned the Marco Polo. I don't know anything about it. I have not done any homework on it. So, if you guys have, can you guys elaborate a little bit? I think I'll let Andrew start off on this because he, I, he, he introduced me to it, and I have got one because of him. So, so Andrew, um, regarding the Marco Polo, kind of. Give us a quick little overview of what it is, what it does, and how easy it is to use. Well, um, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Um, <laughs> so the Marco Polo, Marco Polo is has uh, some proprietary stuff that I don't understand. But basically, it's a radio tracker um, that somehow uh, is also gives you directional uh, directional headings. So basically, the tag. Um, is activated by the, the, the handheld base unit that you carry. 
so that's hence the name Marco Polo. You press track and the and the handheld base station pings or sends a message to the tag that's in your rocket and and it replies back to the base unit. It's a line of sight unit. So mm-hmm. um, it works that way. So um, so basically it tells you um, what direction to travel literally by an arrow on an LCD screen. And it also gives you a percentage. So the mm-hmm. higher percentage, the closer you are. Um, so it works right out of the package. But one of the best things that I personally like about it is that let's say you fly a rocket and you have to track it completely blind. Um, that tag will last up to three weeks. So as, what it does is it's not continuously transmitting. It uh, only replies when it's been pinged. So if it hasn't been if it hasn't been pinged in a while, it goes in standby mode. So the battery lasts an incredibly long time. So mm-hmm. let's just say in a worst case scenario, you you land and you don't have a signal, uh, which can happen. Uh, you have three weeks to get that signal. So uh, in that case, you just have to either hold it higher or start walking in the general direction uh, of where your rocket went or where you think it would be like, you know, they've actually said that standing on the, uh, on the back of your car or, you know, just getting to a higher spot, you can reacquire your signals uh, should you lose it. I have personally used it a number of times and lost my signal only once uh, briefly. Um, but it's the ranges, I believe, up to two miles or two or three miles. Um, so again, I'm, I'm yep. a big fan. I'm a big fan of it. And uh, it's very cost effective and it works right out of the box. You don't have to download an app or buy 3D printed components to accommodate the hardware. And um, I also want to give a shout out to the, the customer service team. I've already destroyed one. Um, and they were really quick to try to repair my <laughs> tech. And that was because of a 20-year-old nice. motor that Andrew trusted to delay on, which was bad, bad, bad decision on my part. <laughs> So it drilled in and and the tag kind of destroyed itself. So the guy actually said, Tim Crabtree actually said, try to send it back, send it back. We'll try to fix it. And um, so they they were unable to, um, but they I bought another one. So I, in my personal opinion, for most of the people who fly, who need to find stuff in crops or grass or lose their signal or lose their rocket, you know, just by sight, this is a great product. Um, so. I personally lost uh, a number of rockets and waist deep beans. And I was actually kind of like, wait a minute, this thing is not working. I was like, you know how your heart start racing and you start to get mad and you're like, this thing's a piece of junk. And, you know, there's no way is this thing out here. I know it landed over there. And and all of a sudden I keep walking. I trust the arrow and I walked right into it. I wouldn't have even nice. seen the dark thing. This is out in Muncie, Indiana. Muncie, Indiana. I kept walking and I was like, there is no way. This hunk of crap. What did I get myself into? And it walked me right up to the rocket. I could not believe it. It was a PML aerial uh, that I inherited. So um, I'm a big fan mm-hmm. of it. it. You know, like anything else, I mean, every tracker has its applications and limitations. But for most people, I think, um, who just need to find it in tall grass or in crops, or if it lands super far away, it's a good economical uh, and robust unit. You can get a, a featherweight system that doesn't have that much protection other than a shrink wrap that you would recommend be put inside something or you get the polycarbonate coated tag. Um, Jim, did you get that one? I can't remember which one you got. Uh, that's really robust. I got the I got the weather tag. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I figure it's right. going to go and in a I big rocket. I can, I can, I can level yeah. three and it landed behind a metal barn and um, and it landed uh, close to a mile away, and I still had uh, my level three went eighty nine hundred feet uh, and change, and I had a lock on it the whole time. I couldn't believe it, and I thought there's no way this thing is gonna uh, keep track of this. And got in the car, and I Cheryl, uh, my wife, God love her, she was holding the thing, and um, she said, "You got to turn around. <laughs> the arrow's going in the other direction <laughs> because, you know, of course, I knew it all." And I was like, "There's no way." And I was like, "Cheryl, it's not ahead of. No, it's right up here." She's like, "No, the arrow turned around." And sure enough, the darn thing led us right up to it. Um, so, yeah, that's my spiel. I know I'm kind of sounding like a fan, a super fan, um, but you know, here's the story: um, Tripoli, Mid Ohio, my beautiful prized. Mac Performance 4-inch Scorpion. 
on a four grain purple EX motor. Um, and I was the only one who landed in chest deep ryegrass. And um, it would have been fun to find that rocket and easy if I just had that tracker. And my wife and I, God love her, she actually went out and helped me try to find it. She says, maybe you should buy your tracker now. And if I would have had nice. the tracker, I would have walked right <laughs> up to that rocket. Yeah. So guess who found the rocket? The farmer found the rocket and it crunched it all up and it's no longer with us. And I'm totally over it. Can't you tell? Yeah. Um, so um, so now, I don't, <laughs> now, now I don't fly without one. And uh, I actually put one, I put a tag on inside a little 38 millimeter motor tube sealed up on either end and uh, duct taped it to the, uh, mm -hmm. to the shock cord. You can fly it that way. You just got to keep it protected. Yep. Um, I would not recommend, it was recommended to me not to put it inside an electronics bay next to all thread. I got to figure out some way um, around that. But you guys are the electronics whiz, whiz brains. I don't, but I guess the all thread would interfere with the radio signal, right? Is that how it works? Yeah. It, yeah. And that's, it could. and that's exactly the, the, you know, the reasoning behind why I've been changing my uh, avionics bay designs where I'm not doing all, th all thread anymore. Um, so, yeah, because what will end up happening is that the more than likely your antenna is going to be sitting um, parallel to the to the all thread, which will cause it to be directional. So, uh, so if you are if your rocket lands in such a way where between the antenna and you is the all thread, then you're not going to get a lot of signal that in that direction. Uh. Um, so you may lose lock with it, or whatever, <clears throat> because that all thread would bounce the signal away. Um, so yeah, you want to make sure that you know wherever it is, the antenna for that unit has is is clear of metal. You know, pretty much, maybe maybe I would say to be safe, maybe like two wavelengths away, depending what frequency what frequency it's working at. Um, mm -hmm. And then then you know it gives you a nice little window aperture. Um, so yeah, so that's that's the reasoning for uh, not having it you know near the all all thread. Okay, yep. and actually, um, with the with the tag unit that I have, um, I have an all weather covering on it, and it's got some mount points. So I will actually take two big plastic zip ties and put them through the tag, and actually just attach it to the shock cord up by the nose cone. Yeah, I want to. So try to do it's that. it's it's out in the open, but it's on. It's zip tied to it's zip tied right to the shock cord. So you know, I've got my you know heavy duty nylon shock cord. I've got two heavy duty zip ties on this thing, and it's and so at deployment when that parachute comes out and that nose cone is deployed, this thing is in the air signaling. And I tried it for the first time um, during like on the same launch where Andrew got his Sick. level three. I had a, a nice L one thousand and a cardboard five and a half half inch rocket that I was just playing with that that's the going to be the test airframe for some right. of uh, CG's further developments into mock so I, I gave it through shake it's shakedown flight and I used a tracker and I did and I'm so glad I used this thing the thing that I like about it because I love the electronics and I love the base station stuff and I love getting all the real time telemetry and stuff but when you're just wanting to do a, a flight and you don't want to have to look at a computer screen and you want to watch the rocket the Marco Polo unit is excellent for that because it's, you, all you have is an arrow and a percentage number, and that's all you need. So you can watch that flight. You can watch the entire flight because I like to see it from all the way from when it goes up to all the way where it comes down and make sure all the deployments and everything. It's, I like the whole process. And um, this, it, my rocket went to probably about 8,000 feet, and I was like, oh, crap, I'm not going to find it. Oh, nice. wow, I'm still getting signal. <laughs> and it was, it was pretty close to Apogee, and I'm still getting signal on this thing. I'm like, okay, I'm sold. And I watched it, and it went over the horizon on the other side of the road, and blah blah blah. And I'm like, all right, my my neighbor who had come up to see the launch with me got pulled out his car, and he's like, come on, let's go get it. And I said, okay. So, and I followed it. And the thing I like about it is the percentage and the arrows together, you can figure it out because there was a little bit of time where the the arrow was going one way, and then it would flip the other way. But I kept on watching the percentages, and as I'm walking to it, I walked right up to it. Um, thankfully it was, uh, and it landed close to a propane tank, which my neighbor thought was hysterical. <laughs> I mean, I'm not that anything was going to happen. <laughs> hey, uh, Jim and, uh, Andrew, does this require a ham radio license? Like some of no. the other, like, it nope. does not. Nope. Okay. See, that answers a lot of questions. Yeah. You pull it out and you use it right away. It even comes pre-charged. And the thing is too, um, is don't forget that you have this has a battery life. The tag has a battery life of three weeks. So let's say you really run into a really big problem. 
and you really can't find this thing. You got three weeks to find it, get a signal. Um, personally, so the longevity is good. Okay. Yeah, the personally, what sold me yeah. on it was I don't remember who this gentleman was. Uh, Gene, maybe you were there, uh, Trip Lehman, Ohio. He did his level three flight. Uh, I think the guy was from Michigan. Anyways, he did his level three flight. He had a GPS and a Marco Polo in it. And the guy was gone. The guy mm-hmm. was gone. I'm sure he's going to probably email if he hears the show. He's going to say, hey, it was me. It was me. Um, but anyway, so he, <laughs> he was out there. Uh, he, he left with his card. He was gone forever. And I ended up talking to him at the end of the day. He said, yeah, um, my GPS worked great, but it, it, I, it somehow it conked out or whatever. But I had almost given up hope and I was just driving down the road and the Marco Polo kept uh, beeped on again. And he says, sure enough, it was the Marco Polo that found it in the wheat field and, and it led him right up to it. Uh, and I was like, dude, I'm buying one of these. You know, I was like, <laughs> after wow. that, I was like, I'm buying mm-hmm. one of these things because after yeah. after the, all that, it was the Marco Polo that saved the day, you know, and it was what, 230 bucks? I mean, that was box. the next question. Um, That's the next question yeah. is what is what is the yeah. price point for this? Because uh, let me let me intervene for a second. So I, you know, I talk about the Apogee tracker a lot, the Ample, uh, I'm sorry. Apogee Simple GPS Tracker. And one of the reasons that I got that is because I live in Colorado and the person who developed it with uh, Tim from Apogee is a Colorado native as well. And he's a member of two of my clubs here in Colorado. So, you know, I had the kind of the inside track on that and then they convinced me, well, go ahead and buy this and try it. And if you don't like it, we'll refund your money. And that kind of stuff came up. And I, I, t- I tell you, like the ease and use of that Apogee Tracker sold me on it. So the fact that you guys have something that's almost half the price of that, that's that consistent with the stuff that you've been launching, it's great for listeners to hear. So thanks for mentioning the price because that was one of the next usually, questions. Yeah. Yeah, so, no problem. Usually if you usually if you try it, you buy it. Now, Gene can attest to this <laughs> okay. too. We've we've we have we have we have loaned them out. I've loaned mine out to a couple of people and they end up buying them. Okay. They end up buying. And Sick. another and another thing too, another thing too is if you're a club, if you're an officer of a club. And you have, and you fly near or in crops, um, and you don't want guests or members plopping rockets in the in the corn or in the soybeans. This is it's cheap enough yep. to be able to buy for a club for it to buy and loan out. You know what I mean? Like hey, you know, like you know, like Mars Club up in Geneseo, they won't let you fly unless you have a tracker if the crops are up. Uh, so they have they when I, last time I was there, they have these 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 ones that you require a ham license for. But if you're a club and don't want to get involved with that, you just buy uh, a Marco Polo with one base unit and three tags. You can loan this thing out and and you know put it on the shock cord, and then it's a, it's an insurance policy because it's cheap enough to buy that way. You know, yeah. I, wow. You know, so uh, and think, you can get yeah. I'm I'm asking for another extra tag for Christmas. Actually, <laughs> that's what was on my list. <laughs> so how much is a tag? Just because, like, if you were to buy a separate one, it's like no a hundred oh bucks. Yeah, it's ninety two nice. bucks. Yeah, tag what? is hundred bucks. You know, yep. yeah, and the free shipping if you order directly from your. If you Google it, Eureka products. Um, I think the tag is like ninety two or ninety six. Uh, there's two different. There's like a bunch of different packages. You can get the base unit in one, base unit in two or three tags. Um, I bought the one with two tags because I wanted. Yep. It plum. But this I, is a great. Yeah, day. and I bought the. I bought mine with just the one tag from Amazon. Right on. So right. it is available oh on gosh. Amazon. All right. Well, yeah, they're, so they're all worth the money. So okay. So okay. Uh, dog collars. Uh, I see a lot of guys here in Colorado. At least two of our members uses dog collars. You guys might have heard Jason Chamberlain mention it on when I interviewed mm-hmm. him back in you know for the Narum sixty. He was talking about the dog collar. Um, that's a pretty expensive apparatus because it's literally to find your pet and it's got a longevity on the battery and all that good stuff too. Do you guys have any experience with that in particular? And how would you compare this next to mm-hmm. that? Not that unit in particular, but the the Marco Polo is also marketed as a pet finder. Okay, all right. So it's, so it is comparable. It, it's got yeah. that same capability. Wow. Right. Yeah. Um, I've, this is great. I, I I'm really impressed with this. It's it's really because it's so simple to use. Like there are times that I just want to hit a button and there's an arrow. <laughs> let me walk okay. to get it. You know right. and. Right. Sometimes, and as much as I love all the high tech stuff, and I get into it, when it comes time to find a big rocket that I'm worried about, that uh, that that I I don't know exactly where it went, I get that little flutter, and it's like I don't want to look at a computer and, and have to put GPS coordinates mm-hmm. into my phone or anything right. to get a map, blah blah blah, and I don't even know. This is a direct signal to your rocket. 
And, wow. And it, um, I, I, I was, I was a mile, easily a mile away from where we launched, and I was able to find it, no problem. And you got so three weeks to I, find it. You got three weeks to find it too. <laughs> How big is the tag? I mean, like, <laughs> yes, you got. Well, let's see. Let me get my ruler here. No, seriously, like, um, uh, with the. This is the polycarbon unit. It's two inches okay. long, the base unit, and about um, about an inch wide. And then the antenna adds another three and a quarter inches. Okay, got it. Wow, they fit great in a lock in a in a lock renewable nose weight system mm-hmm. cartridge. You know, like That's, if yep. you use the lock <laughs> renewable nose weight. That's I just wrapped mine in foam. Got it. And yep. as long as here's one thing we we all didn't mention. We all didn't mention this, but it's really important. For all you uh, folks who like mm. to use metallic uh, paint, don't use metallic flake paint or else you're going to black your signal. Um, I almost sprayed my nose cone with that that cobalt blue metallic, you know, with the fleck in it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I realized that would have killed my signal. Um, so, yeah, I don't want to use metallic paints in it. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm with Gene. It's like you put it in a nose cone and off you go. I mean, I put it in model rockets for all that, you know. Uh, you can put them, they're light enough for model like rockets. Like 60 or, or something. Like it'll just yeah. pop right out, just protect it. It'll easily Got fit it. into that, right. yep. yeah. Yep, you can put in, a, like Andrew said, a 38 millimeter tube will fit nice and easy on that. You can make a little bay. Um, or just do what I do, and it's just, just put it right on the shot cord with some good zip ties. Wow. Yep, you know? That's I did that with and my, that'll do. my Estes, um, my Estes, um, what do you call that thing, a Nike Smoke? You know, that day out there in Amherst, yep. I was like, I don't know, yeah. fine without it. I just taped it right to the <laughs> shot cord. Um, but wow. it has proven itself uh, three times, two times at Muncie and one time in Amherst where I, uh, no, two times in Amherst, so four times in, in the lock aerial um, that I completely lost it in beans. And if anyone's walked in waist-deep beans, they know if it gets below the canopy <laughs> of the beans. And, that conversation has come up on this show multiple times. Right. So <laughs> I can personally attest completely complete trust and need and uh, rely i need to completely rely on this tracker to find this rocket um and i found it four times and that's what really proved it but that those first two times out in muncie i was like what the heck this arrow is full of crap i was like oh man i was like you know you get all nervous and and i i was like nope it landed way back the other way way back so i just kept walking and walked right into it i just couldn't wow so let me mention something to everybody so so we're not getting any incentives or anything from Marco Polo for this stuff. This is testament from real live rocketeers who are talking mm-hmm. about this product. Yes. So anything that anything that absolutely, you guys absolutely. have yep. absolutely. Yeah, I'm going to invite all the listeners. Anything that you guys have used that has been proven for you, please go to the rocketryshow.com website. Look on the right-hand margin, and you'll see a little bit that says send voicemail. Record us something and say, hey, guys, I've used, you know, the missile work system. I've used, um, you know, there's tons of different ones that everybody's used. You know, the dog collar, um, the Apogee one that I talked about, just whatever you guys mm-hmm. have. If you have something that needs a ham radio license, that could be another hobby of yours too. Tell us what you used because other Rocketeers are going to want to know. So just record us a voicemail and we'll talk about it yep. and, and bring it up on the show. It's, it's easy to do. So please take a look at that. Yep. Let us know. And if you don't want to hear your voice, just send us an email. <laughs> Mailbag at the rocketry show.com. Nice. Perfect. Thanks, CG. No problem. Yeah, a- Andrew, this is awesome. I mean, it, it, you know, it's it's all testament. You know, real life rocketeers talking about real life situations. It's stuff that works for you guys. People ask questions to us all the time. And and I, you know, I'm in four or five different chats on Facebook with, you know, anybody from the the Anything Goes Rocketry group to the Colorado Rocketeers group to the Model Rocket Fanatics group. There's so many different groups that I am in an actual chat with some of these folks and they ask me questions. And that's why I'm bringing to the table some of these questions that they ask because, you know, people want to know. And sure, anybody can go and do the homework, but what they're looking for is proven facts. So the fact that you're sharing that with us is great for the show. So yeah. thank you for sharing all this stuff. Real yeah, real life. Sure. It's, a, it's our pleasure. Yeah, I'd love to talk about what works and what doesn't work. And what doesn't work is go fever. That's like the biggest yeah. <laughs> yes. Biggest fun killer is <laughs> yeah. go fever, and I, we all fight it, you know. But yeah, I would love, I'd love to hear how other, everything I know, I learned from someone else and 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 tweaked it, and made it my own. So we all learn from each yep. other. It's wonderful. Yeah. Yes. 
Yeah, and one one last thing about the Marco Polo that I like, just because I have used computers in the field, um, the display is nice. easy to read, and uh, when you when you hold it in your hand, the receiving unit, it comes up. It, it's like a built-in sunshade. <laughs> it opens up when you open awesome. up to look at the display, and it's black and white LCD, so it's a high contrast. So, in a sunny day, you'll be able to see it. Which and sometimes on computers you don't get to see that LCD yep, screen even see on phones. Phone sometimes. Yeah, no, that, sometimes that's great. It's just too bright. So, so you got to crank up the brightness, right. and then you lose your battery, and then you get all mad. <laughs> Real life, the base unit is smaller. Not is smaller than I thought it would be. I mean, I didn't think it was going to be. I mean, I saw the pictures of the people holding it and stuff uh, on mm-hmm. YouTube and things. But it's actually it's a pretty small light base unit. Let's measure it. Yeah, Gene, <laughs> you got it. Uh, it's six inches long. That's to where the handle is to the top okay. of it, and about three inches wide. Wow, that is small. I've seen some pretty wild contraptions where they're, you know, that Yagi antenna looks like a small little, you know, antenna used for a television, yep. <laughs> and they're they're funky looking. And boy, when people have those, like I'm just like, whoa, they're never going to lose their rocket. <laughs> so yeah, the fact that it's that small is kind of cool, you know, because I mean. I always kind of wanted one of those big handheld, you know, TV antenna jobbers, but, you know, those work too. You know, I'm not discrediting it. It's just a smaller unit is nice to put in your pocket when you need to use your hands. So that's what I'm getting at. That's exactly why I like this. And then you can do three different tags on your receiver if you wanted to. You've got, uh, it has three channel capabilities. So, so that's the other thing that's nice. So, you know, you could have your tags in your rockets and turned on if you wanted to. And then, you know, as you go through your prep, then you can just say, okay, I'm on launch one. I'll push button one. Launch two, I'll do launch. I'll do the tracker two. Wow, so. simple. All right. Yeah, I turn my tracker on in, in the morning. It's... Yeah, and at the pad, you know, when you set up your altimeters and everything and you're good to go and you're double checking everything, and that's when you make sure you got signal on your Marco Polo. It's, it's just part of the process. Right. Exactly right. It's nice to be able to turn your tag on in the morning, in the morning uh, when you're loading up or whatever, and just put it in there because you know it'll be on standby <laughs> mode, right? Um, you don't have to wait till you're at the field to turn it on yep. and load it in. You can load it in at home and it'll, you know, just will be in standby mode uh, until wow. you launch later in the day or later in the morning. Um, so is, there, absolutely. is there any advantage to doing that that early other than just knowing that you don't have to worry it about like it? Sounds like it's one less switch to turn on on your flight. You just turn it on in the morning and one less you know, switch. It's, wow. I mean, I'm going to look at this. I mean, the other thing too is consider, consider like a, a big launch, like, you know, um, you know, balls or something and all the pads and your rocket may be sitting on the pad for 45 minutes mm-hmm. or whatever before it gets a chance to get off. You start to worry about your battery life, right? On the, at least on the tracker, that's one less thing that you're worried about. That's a very good point, Jim. Yeah, it's a very good point. See, see, I, I'm I'm looking at this for mm. you know, probably an additional tracking method on the on the you know the big yeah, rockets. or a backup yeah. to right. But like everything yeah, else, I mean, if you just want to work for it, you just want to find it. Um, if you don't want mm-hmm. telemetry, and, and you, if you just want to find it, in most cases, uh, I would say I, I can't really picture a place where it wouldn't work. Um, but you know, if you just want a point and shoot kind of thing, take it out of the box and, and operate it. This is a good good option. Um, yeah, absolutely true. There are a lot of great tracking devices out there, and I've drooled over Garmin for years. And um, I was very mm-hmm. tempted by the Missile Works <laughs> option because I'm a big Missile Works guy. I love their altimeters. I'm, I use Missile Works myself exclusively in my rockets. Um, but uh, I figured if the drone guys like it, um, and they're always crashing in all kinds of urban environments and trees and all <laughs> kinds. Of, I mean, if the drone people like it, um, then you know, I'll give it a shot and just yeah. Then and, <laughs> and they've got radio signal bouncing all over. Then they're you know on their devices. Mm-hmm. So. So, and once again, so, yeah. not to discredit any other tracker that you guys use. I mean, we, we just talked to, you know, Chris from uh, Egg, Egg Timer, you know, and he's got a couple of systems too. Um, Flight Sketch has a lot of good stuff out mm-hmm. there. So, I mean, we're not going to discredit anybody else. I mean, once again, just real, real life stuff that people have used and can testify to. So, yeah, please uh, give us your testimonies for any of the other options that you have because listeners want to know. I mean, we've gotten a lot of questions about stuff like this. That's why we talk about it. So. And, and, you know, and as we all, as everyone knows, I'm developing my own system, but I, I kind of like this Marco Polo to have, you know, in the rocket as well, you know, worse, 
if something were to go wrong and I don't get any data or, or, or who knows, right? You, you have the good old reliable Marco Polo to <laughs> point where it is, yeah. you know. And for those of you doing your level three, I mean, there's a lot of people doing their level threes that have a predominant primary tracker. Marco Polo would be a good backup because you can yep. always give the receiver to the guy going out or the person going out with you to mm-hmm. come pick up your stuff. It's like, okay, I got this one, you got this one, you know, and then you can tag team. Yeah. You know, because that's allowed. Yep. <laughs> oh, you know, I just thought of something with the three channel uh, capability for people who are doing staging and stuff. You can, you know, yeah. put tags in each of them. Okay. You could. I just thought you of could. That. Wow. That's, boom. <laughs> Absolutely. Wow. And oh, one. <laughs> There was one question that somebody asked me um, prior to using it, and I was actually nervous because I couldn't answer it. Uh, he said, well, how's this thing going to hold together if you hit mock or in high thrust situations? And <laughs> a guy from Notra I, I love very well. Um, and I said to him, I was like, well, I don't know. We're going to find out. <laughs> and um, so my rocket... <laughs> so my rocket uh, had a thrust to weight off the pad of over, over 11 to 1. And um, Jeems' rocket was mm-hmm. a next, another next snapper uh, later in the day, and we both <laughs> went, we both went over mock. He did, and I know I did. Um, so ours performed mm-hmm. in high thrust environments, and also in mock environments, it, it performed admirably. So I was relieved because I thought, well, I, I was like, well, I don't know how to answer that. Uh, Mark, I, I will have to find out. <laughs> so I was like, geez, I didn't really think of that. <laughs> I was like, well, it's too late. I have it. <laughs> so, so don't let me down. Yeah. And, I, yeah, that, and I was like, you know, <laughs> I was like, well, if Andrew flies one, I'm going to fly one. It'll be yeah, fine. you go first. You go first. Oh, you go first. <laughs> yeah, you so, go first. Go first. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I was actually quite nervous about that one little point uh, before the launch. Um, because that's all I had in there. I I only had the Marco Polo in the nose cone. Um, so I was worried if, if that's why I cut, encased it in foam. <laughs> I was like, please be safe. You know? <laughs> so, yep. But yeah, it seemed to work great. So. And let's see, it looks like we have uh, another set of questions on what, uh, st- initiators? Yep. <laughs> hey, yeah, um, yeah. Let, me, let me talk to that real quick, CG. So in my local Colorado club, uh, yesterday, these guys went and launched BT-55 goblins, stock Estes goblins. Okay, not stock. Some of them had a Toby Vanderbeek upgrade with through-the-wall fins, right? But these mm-hmm. guys went out there and launched them on F-44 mm-hmm. Enerjets. F-44s. BT-55 goblins. Mm. Nice. 24 <laughs> millimeter motor mount, right? So these guys had no fear. Marco they go Polo. out there and they launch them. Need a Marco Polo. Well, yeah. Some of these guys didn't have trackers. But the question is, when they try to launch them all, and we have a really nice uh, Wilson FX launch system there in the you know club that they they went and did all this on, it should have had more than enough power you know to light all four of those rockets at the same time. But they had the regular little, um, the red igniters that come with those. Um, they're, they're a stock Aerotech igniter, and I'm sure you guys have seen them, in, or you probably have a bunch of them. Yes. So they didn't all fire at the same time. So Jim. Uh, my question to you, and then of course we have Andrew here to back you up. I know that you have made your own igniters. In lieu of those little red ones yes. that particularly may not have set off the F-44s, what would you guys have used? Is that a good scenario question? Um, yeah, I guess I guess it could be the um, um because sometimes with those with those small red igniters, and I've noticed that they've changed the formula apparently on some newer batches that it's different now. So it, hopefully it's uh, it's changed a little bit. But sometimes they would come and the power gen would be cracked when you look at it, right. which right. I can't stand. But mm. um, <laughs> you know, but you do need you need to need that small like that small head on there so you can get it inside those smaller nozzles. And so what I have done with all of that stuff is. I actually will take those igniters and dip them into my pyrogen just to give it a small coat, like an overcoat of pyrogen on that Aerotech igniter. And then I'll just let that dry and I'll use that. Okay. So to make it simple, that's, that's exactly what I'll do. Right you know, just take a little bit of pyrogen, <clears throat> mix, um, thin it out or whatever, 
and just do it that way. Um, I've done that because with my Tark team, Got they go it. through a lot of single use uh, okay. 29 millimeter motors, and we can't afford to have any misfires, you know, because I'm not going to spend $20 <laughs> billion dollars right. on igniters for these guys. I don't have it in the budget, <laughs> right? So by buying a Pyrogen okay. kit, um, that's the quickest and easiest way to do it. And, and so I'll just dip them and then I'll use and those. And your success rate has been? Wow. Okay. 100% okay. so far. Thank you, Jim. Wow. Uh, Andrew, have you played with any of that stuff too? I have a deep, dark secret. Uh-oh. Uh, deep, dark no. secret. See, huh? I have a, I have really a deep, want to dark hear it. Secret. Can you talk about it? It's not. Well, it's it's kind of controversial. But okay, so... So um, we always say we always say in the lab um, correlation is not always causation. So I have, my deep mm-hmm. dark secret is just because you had all red igniters doesn't mean it was the igniter problem. If if the clips weren't freshly sanded or the connection True. connections uh, were limiting mm-hmm. it in their power, you know every time I hook up a rocket at the pad, I always bring sandpaper and sand the clips prior. But my deep dark secret, mm-hmm. it, to be honest with you, is I've I've read. Now, Jim and Corny, maybe you can, you know, remind me of, of past experiences that my senior brain has forgotten, but I actually have had wonderful luck with copperheads and the little red igniters. Mm-hmm. Um, I've really been <laughs> yes. almost near near mm-hmm. 100% yes. with um, 100% with my my uh, the igniters that come with my um, my motors, my, especially my my single use uh, ones from from Aerotech. So. I feel I feel bad that you guys didn't have them all go off at the same time, but I'd be willing to bet um, that if you had a rusty clip somewhere or even two clips, uh, uh, then that mm-hmm. would probably limit the amount of juice coming to the igniter. Because even it. if the pyrogen, pyrogen at the end, right. create all that resistance, even if it's right. Even, right. So I, I I wish I had more to add to it. I mean, but I've I I can't say, you know, I've had bad luck with, with commercial igniters since I haven't. I mean, I've always, um, may, maybe I haven't, I forgot, but nothing that actually stands out. But I've noticed that every time I, I take a, hit the clips with 220 and wrap the lead, wrap the wire around the outside of the clip, I've wow. generally always had, uh, now the igniter may have fired, but that doesn't, you know, it's done, it, it, right. it's done its right. job. But if you're, if it's positioned improperly or, uh, if you have some oxidation mm-hmm. in your grain, um, especially if it's a white lightning, they have oxidation problems or any hydrophilic, you know, propellant that that oxidizes, it, right. it won't, it'll have a hard time lighting. So I don't know if I've e- even contributed anything to this conversation with that. You did. Bit, yes, but, you did. Um, well, yeah, because you, I mean, yeah. yeah, that's my dark secret. I used to love copper ads. I, I miss them. I have a ton <laughs> and I use them. <laughs> It's, it's funny that you mentioned it because <laughs> I, because you you because you share you share with me all of your tricks with the with the copperheads, <laughs> and uh, so once I once I had all your tricks and and it all made sense. I had great success rate with it as well. The only time I ever had problems if, is if I had a motor where the grains were really right. oxidized, and the uh, downside to that is the first time you have a misfire in such a s- situation. The grains get all coated with the misfire, <laughs> oh, so it, yeah, so it makes it even yeah. harder to, the 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 next time around. But one of the tricks with the copperheads is that that Andrew told me about is that you very carefully put a little bend in the in the pyrogen side of it or right near it, so that when you slide it in there, the tip of it's making contact with propellant, and, with and you got to make yep. sure it's all the way up in there too. And you know that that trick alone, you know, just increase the odds of it. Of a, of a first time launch greatly. <laughs> so, and, and that, and, you know, and making sure you get all the current, you know, by keeping those clips clean. Yeah. So you get 100% of the current that's that's coming at the end of those wires into that, you know, that starter. Uh, and, and, and you'll notice it too, because it's, uh, you know, it'll light within, let me see, because my controllers all have a, uh, my computer control launch controller, I'll have a pre programmed uh, length of time that'll hold the charge. On, the current on the igniter. So you just hit the button once and it'll hold it for like six seconds. And with all the tricks I learned from Andrew and making sure things are clean, it's almost always launches within two, two to three seconds. Right. You know, the, where the motor goes. Yeah. And, you know, and those are all great are. tips. That's, you know, they, and the, the problem is the copperheads, they're, you know, they're, they're hard to find yeah. now. I still have a couple that I'm hanging on to, but I've always, I've always enjoyed those too, ever since those tips and tricks, you know, but, wow. uh, <clears throat> but the, 
Wow. I probably have a hundred or so. Wow. <laughs> and another thing with the <laughs> copperheads is that people would uh, uh, short them out all the time. So one <laughs> right. of the tricks that uh, yep. one of the Andrew tricks was, you know, take some masking yep. tape and you put a masking tape on one yep. side, on and one side, put it on the other yep. side, so the that you know side. when you you just put the clips on there and the masking tape will. Um, Insulate yep. the other side of it so you don't short it out. <laughs> create your own, <laughs> create your own series circuit. Yeah, yeah, yeah and <laughs> right. Back to back to the pyrogen thing. I would like to like I get my pyrogen from Rocket Flight. Um, it's R O C K E T F L I T E dot com. Rocketflight dot com. Uh, Greg Dybin is the guy that I work with, and I love his mix on stuff because it's 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 not that expensive. You know, you can get a pyrogen kit for like thirty bucks, and that is enough pyrogen to do hundred okay. dips easily. You know, mm-hmm. and you guys, and he also is nice enough to give you a little acetone to cut it with, so you can make right. it a little thinner if you want. Because sometimes it's, but it's not that expensive, and don't be afraid to try this. You know, it's perfectly all right to to make you know dip your own igniters. I'm actually having a lot of fun with that because I can, you know, make something a little bit more energetic. I've even dipped some of the Estes <laughs> igniters for for black powder motors just for the fun of it. You know, because I don't like you know, right. the newer ones. I like right. the ones that were black. You know, for my black powder motors. So I've even the dipped igniters, those, and not it the works starters, just fine. Right. So it's. <laughs> hey, I've seen, yeah. I've seen <laughs> pictures Whatever. of your igniters, Jim, <laughs> and uh, you know they look as good as something that is with an Aerotech or a Loki, or well, Loki uses like a Twiggy type igniter, but um, yeah, even you know CTI just uses you know they have that pellet that's inside of their motors, mm-hmm. but I mean your stuff looks like it was made by Aerotech, so I mean you're doing it, you're doing it right. right. So I trust you. That's awesome. Oh, thanks. It's not that hard. I mean, mm-hmm. that was my first run of making those too when I sent you those pictures. So, but I've dipped like <laughs> wow. probably about 500 of them by now. Um, and okay. for the kids, it's just, a, it's mm-hmm. a great way to go. You know, they, they, they're like, you making igniters, Mr. Seibel? I'm like, yeah, better believe it. And I'm, and actually all I'm doing is enhancing the ones I've got. You know, I mean, I do have, so I started getting into the dipping from, I was looking around and I found rocket flight and I was like, I wanted some small um, igniters yep. for those, uh, Yes. The Quest, you know, the the D's, the Quest Jets. And I was like, you know, these things are, man, it's a small hole. So I went and I bought the, some, some of the Rocket Flight igniters for small motors. And I was like, okay. And I can put um, a couple, I can uh, increase the amount of pyrogen by dipping a little deeper into the, so it's covering instead of a half inch, maybe a full inch of wire. And I've had no problem with them. Like I had some problems with the Q jets when I first started flying them, because you know new motors, new little tiny igniters, you know whatever, tiny starters. So I've been dipping those because like for the rocket camps and stuff, the kids love seeing Q jets go up. Who doesn't, right? So, um, so dipping it that way, I've I've had a hundred percent success rate, and I must have done about twenty five, you know, Q jets by this point in my life, and I've never had a problem with them ever since I started doing it. So it's an option, and and it's fun. <laughs> It is fun. <laughs> well, let's see here. I, I I think we still had other things we wanted to yeah. talk about, but I think at this point the show <laughs> was is plenty long. So I think you had a great show um, for your Christmas, New Year's, Hanukkah, whatever. Um, so we would like to say Happy Holidays to you, and uh, hope your New Year uh, is going great. And uh, yeah, let's all hope that twenty twenty one is way better. <laughs> <laughs> More flights, yeah, more, more flights, flights and everything else. So, Andrew, thank you hey, so much. Thank you. It was fun. Uh, I mean, wow. I really had a great time. Really did. It's great chatting with you guys again. Cool. Yes. And so we'll, we'll definitely have to have you back on again because, you know, one of the other things that you uh, are good at is painting. So, uh, uh, rocket <laughs> painting. And, uh, yeah, that's a whole other discussion. I could get us going for another half hour. <laughs> <laughs> It's my love-hate relationship with so, rocketry. You know, it's 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 a tumultuous, tumultuous, <laughs> that's how you pronounce it, relationship, painting rockets. <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> so anyway, so on that note, keep your eyes in the skies. All righty. We'll see you next time here on The Rocketry Show at therocketryshow.com. Happy New Year. Have a comment? We'd love to hear it. Send them to mailbag at therocketryshow.com. If you enjoyed what you heard, don't forget to check out our sister show, themodelrocketshow.com. The Model Rocket Show is hosted by the Rocket Noob and is all about low to mid-power rocketry. 
TheMobileRocketShow.com with Daniel, the Rocket Noob. Check it out today. The views and opinions expressed on these programs are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Little Beth Entertainment or its sponsors.